Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the role that probiotics have in promoting coral health. Hello and welcome back everyone. Uh, this is Amr Azul TV and uh, we have another episode of Reef Science. So today I'm going to tell you about uh, new research on how probiotics can help coral health. And uh, what you're seeing are a video that I recently took uh, diving in the Red Sea uh, in Egypt. And uh, this is, a, I think, a great example of a healthy coral le uh, reef, lots of uh, colonies of Acropora, lots of fish, uh, uh, no signs of uh, uh, bleaching and the degradation. But this is not all honky-dory. Obviously, we know that there are some places in the world, like the Great Barrier Reef, where there's been uh, mass destruction in terms of uh, corals, uh, corals because of bleaching. And this is a hot area of research right now, trying to understand the factors that cause coral bleaching, but also how we could, uh, what we could do to uh, prevent this bleaching and recover uh, coral uh, populations. You know, the Great Barrier Reef, it's been really devastated and it's, you know, it's not the only place that's uh, suffered from bleaching. Uh, uh, there's lots of coral reefs off of the coast of Florida that have also experienced severe bleaching and, uh, and other kind of events. Uh, so today I'm going to share with you a couple of uh, two interesting papers that uh, I come across and I want to kind of highlight because I think they have uh, potential application for the, our hobby in terms of uh, trying to make our corals in our tank healthier and obviously yeah, <laughs> making the corals in the reef uh, is the number one priority but if there's anything that we could uh, do in our tanks that could uh, make us better uh, uh, better able to deal with uh, pests and diseases and and keep colonies healthier for longer then obviously it's a it's a win-win all right here are the two papers that i'd like to discuss the first one is by amy mcdermott in pnas uh, published a couple of weeks ago uh, you could actually access this uh, this article. It, it's not a peer-reviewed literature. It, it's simply a, a nice, a very nice summary by Amy on uh, the kind of the current state on uh, what what's causing coral coral bleaching and and what are the most pro uh, promising approaches to kind of uh, recover coral populations. Uh, very very uh, nice uh, overview of the state of the field right now. Uh, and then the, most of the time we're going to focus on this paper that was actually published late in December 2018. It's by Rosado et al. in uh, uh, the IS, the Is Me journal. I, <laughs> and uh, it's also open access so you could go ahead and download both of these articles and, and have fun reading them. We're going to start with a summary of the relationship between zooxanthellae and coral tissues. This is a, a summary that I got from uh, uh, OceanServices.noaa.gov. Uh, you could uh, click this link and follow it. But here's an example of uh, Acropora, and it's got these uh, little uh, uh, zooxanthellae, which is kind of a type of algae. And so the coral is able to feed with its polyps. Uh, but the zooxanthellae within the cor uh, coral uh, through photosynthesis is able to generate sugars, lipids, and oxygen, and these are kind of shared with the coral. S and then the coral passes water and carbon dioxide to the zooxanthellae. So this is the what we think is a, a symbiotic, mutualistic interaction. The zooxanthellae gives the coral some things, and the corals pass on other things that the zooxanthellae needs. Uh, so in theory, that's how things work. So here is an example of the current or the old paradigm, maybe not the old, but the, the traditional paradigm of what causes corals to bleach. Uh, so when we have situations of stress, uh, such as heat, uh, uh, and we, we know that a lot of coral bleaching events have been associated with heat and climate change, but not all bleaching events were associated with heat and not all warm uh, waters uh, cause coral bleaching and so what happens is uh, what we think is happening is that when there's a heat stress uh, then the photosynthesis that is going inside the algae somehow the machinery breaks down and instead of uh, generating oxygen it it uh, generates reactive oxygen species ROS. reactive oxygen species is is typically bad it oxidizes things really quickly and it could damage the, the tissue on, in the actual coral uh, so what we think happens is that uh, when the algae starts producing reactive oxygen species then the coral just kind of kicks it out and lead, leads to bleaching and you know if short term if the 
new algae doesn't uh, repopulate the coral, then the coral essentially just dies. And so this idea has been uh, summarized very nicely by Weiss in this uh, uh, Journal of Experimental Biology paper in 2008. So that is one way we think coral, uh, why corals could bleach. But there was this kind of this new idea that actually zooxanthellae and coral tissues are mutualistic, so, uh, mutualistic only in a kind of a narrow range of conditions. And then if the conditions stay, change and become stressful, then their relationship turns from mutualism to parasitism. Uh, so the idea that when things are bad, the algae and the corals don't share well. So uh, there is uh, a few studies that are uh, putting forward this, uh, this hypothesis uh, and the uh, citations are here. But the idea is that when, when we have uh, heat stress, there's no thing, Sally still produces sugar, lipids and oxygen, but it's not sharing them with the coral host. And the coral host is not sharing carbon dioxide and, and carbon with the, with the algae. That leads to kind of a breakdown of the relationship, a, a, a divorce of uh, some sort. Uh, which is neither beneficial for the coral or the algae. All right, so how do we stop this from happening? That's kind of the, the million dollar question. Um, it's, it's obviously important to prevent coral bleaching in, in natural reefs, right? We want to have our coral reefs. They, they support a lot of biodiversity. The most biodiversity in, in oceans is found in uh, coral reefs. Uh, but it's also an applied question, right? We want to be able to uh, prevent RTN and STN in, in, in our aquarium. One possible solution to this is microbiome. All right, so if you uh, uh, Google microbiome, you're gonna get uh, lots and lots of information. This is a super hot area in, in research and, uh, and human health right now. Uh, so put it simply, the microbiome is just a collection of microorganisms that live on or in animals. And uh, research over the past five years is suggesting that the microbiome uh, is very critical to the health of its host. So in humans, there's been links, uh, uh, the microbiome helps us essentially uh, metabolize foods, uh, it, uh, helps our immunity uh, lots of claims um, some research backing uh, these claims up uh, and uh, we know that uh, you know you could go out and, and buy probiotics to help uh, boost your immune system and, and that sort of thing again uh, it's an area where there is a lot of things being sold without actually scientific backing and the same goes not just for like human health you know for other pets so I for fun I searched probiotics and dog health and you could buy all kinds of supplements for your dogs you could buy all kinds of probiotic supplements for your cats you could even buy lots of probiotic supplements for your fish and again uh, lots of claims not so much science and so th this kind of led me into uh, finding this paper that we're gonna spend time discussing because as far as I'm concerned it's one of the very few if not the only paper uh, that is uh, looking at the direct uh, impact of uh, uh, probiotics and the microbiome uh, on uh, coral health directly and, and how how it uh, allows corals to uh, deal with stress and there are several products already in the hobby that are advertised as like probiotics. Uh, so here is an example of uh, Aquaforest, uh, which makes a probiotic salt and a whole bunch of probiotic additives. Uh, but if you if you read the literature, uh, uh, not like the scientific literature, but the actual like manufacturer literature, the literature by Aquaforest, you quickly see that a lot of these products are essentially all they're doing is, is adding bacteria that are going to deal with ammonia and nitrogen and and phosphates. So they're they're not really directly influencing or improving coral health by by allowing the the corals to actually deal with with stressors uh, they're simply uh there are bacteria in a bottle that is meant to uh, uh establish the biofilter and manage uh, nitrogen and and phosphates uh, nit uh, nitrates and phosphates uh, using kind of a variant of uh, carbon dosing so this is the exact kind of the bolded text here is uh, indicating this so bio s Quick and effective elimination of ammonia and nitrogen. ProBioS designed to accelerate the decomposition of organic matter, and NP Pro is essentially a, a source of carbon. Carbon dosing to keep your uh, uh, denitrifying bacteria happy. So this is not what I'm talking about here. I'm uh, I'm actually talking about like uh, probiotic supplements that will help corals directly by allowing them to kind of fight infections and and uh, be more uh, uh, be more resilient to stress. So the paper that I want to share with you today uh, by Rosado et al. Uh, 
again published in 2008, uh, did exactly that. So we're going to walk through the paper and kind of explain the main figures. Uh, all right, so here is figure one from uh, the paper, uh, and effectively what the authors did is they went, and so the whole paper was focused on uh, cauliflower corals, Pulsilipora, and so they actually took the corals and they isolated bacteria living in the corals and in the surrounding seawater. They cultured the bacteria, they sequenced the bacteria, and they essentially identified uh, harmful components of, of uh, the microbiome, uh, things like the uh, uh, bacteria that could cause diseases and so on. And then they only extracted uh, and cultured the beneficial bacteria. And, and uh, th there is the kind of the beneficial probiotics in, in their falcon tube. Uh, they call this, uh, this, they call this throughout the paper, uh, PBMC, that's putative, uh, sphere putative beneficial microorganisms for corals. Uh, for short, I'm just going to call them probiotics. Two things that you should note about how they applied the probiotics is it was applied as a coral dip. So they actually took out the frags and they, uh, they sprinkled, they pipetted uh, this uh, probiotic solution directly on the coral. So this wasn't dissolved in aquarium water. All right, so that's kind of the, the basic idea of how they isolated the probiotics. And here is the, the, the experiment that they actually did. So uh, in the experiment, they started out with uh, day one, the, co uh, the colonies, uh, the frags being at uh, the, a typical reef temperature of 26 degrees Celsius or 78.8 uh, Fahrenheit. That's kind of what I keep my tank at. And so the frags were acclimated there for uh, uh, 10 days. And then they started the experiment. So they actually started heating up uh, temperature. So there was a temperature stress going from 26 to 30 degrees Celsius. So that's uh, about 86 Fahrenheit, that's pretty high. Uh, and then they had three, uh, well, four treatments. Uh, a control, which had no change uh, in temperature and, and none of these other uh, kind of inoculations. Uh, one treatment included inoculating the corals with uh, gram-negative bacteria called Vipro that actually causes uh, a disease for uh, Pocillopora. Pos uh, so that was just uh, bacteria on its own, but uh, harmful bacteria on its own. Then they also uh, took the frags and they added the uh, beneficial probiotics. And then they had a treatment where they added the bacteria, the, uh, the uh, uh, disease-causing bacteria, as well as the probiotics. And they kind of monitored uh, several aspects of uh, coral health, including uh, whether they bleach or not, as well as the ability for the, coral, the algae within the corals to uh, undergo photosynthesis. So the figure two from the paper, uh, briefly, here are the four treatments. So this is the control, this is the probiotics, this is the disease-causing bacteria, this is the disease-causing bacteria and the probiotics. Uh, every panel has before uh, pictures of the corals and after. And what you're showing here is uh, if, if there's any change in color. So they have here D2 pale, uh, D5 is the darkest, and then D3 and D4 are kind of shades uh, in between. So in the control experiment, there was essentially a, a small loss of color as, uh, as the colonies warmed up from uh, 26 to, uh, 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 from 78 to 86 Fahrenheit. Uh, so here kind of heat is essentially causing a bit of a stress and it's making uh, a bit of, the, uh, it's making the corals bleach to, to a small extent. But the treatment that had the beneficial probiotics experienced no loss in color. So that was a positive effect. Probiotics essentially uh, saved the corals from some of the heat stress that they were experiencing. Uh, the corals, when you uh, give them uh, Vibro, which is the uh, disease-causing bacteria, uh, most of them kind of bleached over, uh, over the course of the experience, uh, experiment. So you see them going from like D4s and D5s really dark to D2s. But... Uh, the corals that were inoculated with the disease-causing bacteria, but given the probiotics, actually showed no to low loss in color. So this suggests that the probiotics rescued the corals from the Vibro infection. So both of these studies suggest that the probiotics are helping the corals deal with the heat stress, and they're helping the corals de uh, deal with the uh, exposure to uh, this uh, disease-causing bacteria. 
this is another figure, figure three from the paper. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, let me just walk you through it. So in the y-axis here, we have v, uh, FV divided by FM. And this is simply a, a measure of photosynthetic efficiency of the algae living inside the corals. The higher the number, the, the more efficient the photosynthesis is. And then on the y-axis, on the x-axis actually, we have the days uh, uh, over the experiment. And then the different lines here indicate the different treatments. Uh, so it's a super busy figure, but just quickly what I want to call your attention is that uh, all of these four lines here, uh, these were the all treatments at 26 degrees Celsius. Uh, the worst two lines here were the 30 degrees Celsius treatment that had no uh, that had no uh, probiotics. Uh, so uh, these either had or didn't have the uh, Vibro, the disease-causing bacteria, but none of these two treatments had the beneficial probiotics. These two treatments were done at high temperature but did have the probiotics. So you could think of these kind of two circles here. One is both of them are lower than 26. So obviously raising the temperature is a heat stress that is gonna stress out the corals. And here the stress will lead to reduced photosynthesis of the algae. But what's very clear is that the two treatments at the high temperature that did have the probiotics did much better than the two treatments at high temperature without the probiotics. So again, uh, we have strong evidence that uh, treatment of probiotics here is uh, enhancing the ability of the algae inside the bacteria uh, to, uh, sorry, the algae inside the corals to actually undergo photosynthesis. So uh, uh, and to summarize, the probiotic treatments prevented the coral or, or reduced the probability of corals bleaching and the zooxanthellae inside the corals uh, did better when they had the beneficial bacteria. All right, so uh, I think overall, I, I think this is super promising. I'm, I'm really glad that somebody's uh, doing this research to actually um, kind of uh, uh, show whether probiotics could have a uh, beneficial uh, effect on corals. And, and so far uh, from this one study, there, there does seem to be a positive effect. A couple of uh, unresolved questions that I have when reading the paper. Uh, one is I wanted to know whether the beneficial community, uh, yeah, whether that's really unique to Pasolopora or will it benefit other corals. So uh, just to uh, remind you that uh, the probiotics that the authors uh, used for this paper were specifically isolated from Pasolopora. And uh, to what extent uh, this kind of mix of uh, beneficial community of microorganisms is going to benefit Acropora or, or different species of Acropora. Uh, it obviously would be great if, uh, if the probiotics were general. Uh, so that means that we don't have to like uh, discover them uh, from scratch every time we want to uh, rehabilitate a coral or, or uh, test out a frag. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, that's uh, more work needs to be done in this area, obviously. Uh, I wanted to know whether uh, this could work if it was uh, if the probiotics were just uh, infused or dosed in the salt water. Uh, obviously, dipping corals is, is time consuming and probably like uh, 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 is not amenable uh, for uh, big colonies. And, and so it's obviously, you know, it's also so much easier to just kind of add this, those in the salt water. Uh, but the all the older results from this paper were done from uh, dipping corals. And so it, it's hard to know uh, if it's, uh, if it's going to be, uh, if dosing the salt, uh, the probiotics directly in the salt water is going to have the same effect. And then finally, uh, are the uh, beneficial uh, community of microorganisms in, 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 in a mixture of probiotics, whether that's actually going to be sustainable in the home aquaria? So is this something that uh, you would have to dose every month to kind of continue to see benefits? Uh, or or uh, you dose it once and, and you're good for a long period of time. So obviously, if, if the beneficial uh, microbiota requires some kind of special food that we don't typically add in, in, a, in a tank, then, then uh, I could imagine them kind of persisting for a short period of time and then just kind of uh, uh, yeah, yeah, going extinct. Uh, potentially, they, they could be getting outcompeted by uh, the mix of my, uh, bacteria that is found in our tank. So overall, I think this is a, a really exciting study. That, I mean, it's a proof of concept study showing that yes, probiotics can possibly affect uh, coral health, 
and uh, I would like to see more of this type of work because uh, I think this is going to be a key bit of the puzzle that we need to uh, solve to uh, to not only rehabilitate our reef uh, ecosystems in the wild but also be better aquarist. Alright guys, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you're new to this channel, please do hit that subscribe button. It does give me uh, extra motivation to continue making content. Alright, thank you so much and see you around.